So our next speaker is Graham Walker from MIT, who uh, uh, actually served on my thesis committee when I was in Sue Lovett's lab back in the day. Um, so he's going to talk uh, about, I'm not exactly sure what yet, because the title of his talk is A Passion for Biology, A Passion for Life. So I'm excited to see what you have to say. <laughs> so please go ahead and share your screen, Graham. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you, um, Evelyn. It's a true honor to be here. Happy birthday. Um, I was lucky enough, as I'll tell you, to meet Evelyn when I was a postdoc in the mid-1970s. Uh, I've never <clears throat> known her ever since, so I want to not only talk a little bit about the development of some of these scientific concepts that she played such a role in, but also just share some highly uh, personal recollections of the voyage along the way, because my own uh, science and my own uh, life have been <laughs> influenced very strongly by these attributes of uh, Evelyn, which are so evident, uh, her passion for biology and her just her passion for life in general. So I have some of this pictures from the archives of Cold Spring Harbor, <clears throat> which you'll probably see some of these again. Just one thing to point out, I wasn't there for this part of it. This was picture was a year before I was born, which meant that this picture from 1950, uh, I was um, five years old when uh, this picture was taken in 1953 of Evelyn talking to Barbara McClintock. And there have been comparisons between Barbara and Evelyn, which I think are uh, rightly made, and the fact that they both worked on enormously complex problems and that their thinking about these problems was so sophisticated that it took quite a while for the rest of the scientific community to catch up with both of them. That was, interestingly, at the meeting when uh, Jim uh, Watson uh, presented their structure of DNA with this iconic photo. Um, I was only five, but I remember this was back in the days when there was a huge magazine that would come once a week called Life. And I remember my father telling me there was something really important. I didn't totally understand it, but I still have a memory of looking through this and what, trying to, I knew it was exciting, but I wasn't quite sure what it was, uh, but I didn't know till later how it would influence my career. Well, there's already been some comments how when Evelyn, uh, came from uh, Columbia to Cold Spring Harbor to work. And she, uh, in what she ascribes uh, in her writing as beginner's luck, managed to get an amazing mutant of E. coli uh, that was 100 times more resistant to killing by UV than other things. And I believe at the suggestion of my former colleague and Nobel laureate, Salvador Luria, she looked under the microscope and discovered that what was happening was that <clears throat> the standard E. coli B strain, when you gave it a shot of UV, <clears throat> was failing to septate and forming long filaments. And I think Evelyn rightly recognized there this, the importance of that. This was a phenotype. It wasn't obviously just something to do with DNA that was being affected. It was a physiological response to DNA damage. And she published, continued to do this, uh, follow this theme as well as work on mutagenesis. And there were two papers she published in 1967 that I want to highlight because I think they were enormous, enormously prescient and they um, also influenced my career and my, my science uh, in very important ways. <clears throat> in one of them, she described the striking parallels between the induction prophage lambda and this filamentous growth that she'd uh, um, observed uh, a number of years earlier and proposed that perhaps there was a cell regulator similar enough to lambda repressor to be regulated by the same signal. That is the heart of the SOS idea right there. Um, she continued to sc scour the literature, talk to everybody at meetings and find other phenomena that might be uh, <clears throat> examples of other induced physiological phenomena. And by, uh, she published a review at the end of 1976 and the list had grown uh, longer. Um, these 
effects were by and large dependent on the function of the RecA and the LexA genes, although the function of those uh, proteins wasn't too well understood. The word um, SOS got attached uh, because of Miroslav of Rodman, shown here with Evelyn in uh, 2012 in picture in Paris. Um, and Miro, who it turned out hadn't read <laughs> some of Evelyn's key papers, had nevertheless uh, written a little typewritten memo uh, in which he uh, put forward the idea there might be a special type of DNA replication induced by uh, DNA damage. And um, Miro was never really good about publishing his results, especially in his early years. And uh, this memo got a lot of attention because uh, um, Evelyn, as she did, promoted <laughs> the ideas of a younger scientist and gave enormous credit to Miro. Uh, and uh, reminded him perhaps he should read some of her papers too, I believe. But uh, in any case, um, this is Miro suggested the term SOS, and uh, Evelyn embraced that. And that's how we know these rec lexate dependent phenomena as being SOS responses now. Um, Bryn Bridges uh, managed to and, uh, republish uh, this uh, paper of, um, of Miro's, which eventually appeared in a book some years uh, later. Um, but I noted this, uh, for those of you who know Miro, he notes that a facsimile of the Radman paper is uh, reproduced uh, using the clearest pages from a copy held by uh, Evelyn Whitkin and a copy reacquired by Radman, who mislaid his own copy, which for those of us who know Miro, really wasn't too much of a surprise. And the second prescient paper that Evelyn uh, published in, in 1967 suggested that perhaps the induced function that uh, she'd found or inferred was needed for mutagenesis could be an error-prone polymerase that copies over lesions and makes mistakes. And that's become so much of a part of our thinking, it's hard to know where that idea originated, but you've just heard uh, Steve talk about it. <clears throat> my pathway to, to meeting Evelyn uh, started, I think, in my introductory biology class at Carleton University, Donova, Canada. I was a chemistry major and I had to take an introductory biology course. And there was DNA and I was just fascinated and decided that was the coolest molecule in the world and I wanted to work on it. And I was lucky enough to have had some wonderful mentors, uh, Bob Whiteman, uh, took this enthusiastic undergrad under his skin and let me synthesize a nucleotide in his lab and hooked me up with a group at National Research Council headed by Saran Narang, who was competing with my later MIT colleague trying to synthesize the first gene. And uh, so it was terribly exciting. And Bob Whiteman suggested I go to University of Illinois to work with Nelson Leonard, who was a wonderful organic chemist. Actually, he synthesized chloroquine who started to work on nucleotides. And while I was there, I met Aki Willenbeck, a young biochemist uh, who was full of enthusiasm. And I was so blessed to have <clears throat> these uh, folks as mentors. But I had decided by the time I'd done some chemistry and a little bit of biochemistry that I needed to learn some genetics on my postdoc. <laughs> and I went to work uh, with Bruce Ames at Berkeley, uh, attracted by his enthusiasm and his sort of physiological understanding. Um, that's what I looked like at the time. And as I'll tell you, uh, so when Evelyn met me, that's <laughs> what the guy she was meeting looked like that. But um, Bruce uh, had done a lot of work, as many of you know, studying histidine biosynthesis. He had many mutants, and he had this idea for a short-term test for mutants instead of spending a million dollars using mice to test for possible carcinogens, perhaps you could use bacteria, developed a rather simple reversion test. And even though he did quite a number of clever things, it still wasn't that effective until 1974 when he introduced a derivative of a naturally occurring drug resistance plasma that strikingly increased the number of mutations you got for the same amount of DNA damage. And I arrived in the lab just after that had happened. And Bruce was terribly excited about the test because it was now good enough to use. And I got in the lab and I thought, hmm, there's something on that uh, plasmid that might be 
uh, uh, must be involved in taking damaged DNA and making it into mutated DNA. And maybe if I worked on that, I could gain some insights. Bruce was happy to let me work on it for a while. Later, he kind of wished he, he kept encouraging me to look at flame retardants in kids' pajamas, and I kept diplomatically dodging that suggestion because I didn't think that would lead to the kind of job I was hoping for. But I made some progress on this, and I managed to find it was in um, E. coli, and it was very hard. There was no uh, PubMed at that point, and Bruce had a lot of reprints uh, in many, many loose leaf folders in his office. And he picked out about a four foot stack of them and said, you might find some things in here. And I learned out, I started to hear about this Reque and Lexa phenomena. And I managed to get some mutants from John Clark's lab up the hill. And inspired by some of Evelyn's experiments, I discovered that the phenomena I was studying on protective effect and more mutagenesis were inducible phenomena. And I had gotten some mutants of PKM101 that had lost the, those abilities. And, but I was having trouble understanding this DNA repair field because the literature was scattered. And particularly, there had been an, uh, a very important meeting in 1974 that I'd obviously missed. And uh, a lot of the papers referred to this upcoming volume, which didn't appear until my second year as a postdoc. So I was sort of scrambling to learned the field and then the phone rang one day and it was Evelyn. <laughs> she introduced herself and said, uh, whose name I had been reading her papers. And she said, I hear you have some really interesting results of some connections between this plasmid PKM 101 and the uh, SOS response. I'm in town, could I meet you? And so there is a raw postdoc. Uh, I got to meet Evelyn and I had no idea at that time that when I'd gone to Bruce's lab, I was not only going to acquire a wonderful scientific colleague and dear friend, but also someone who would basically be a mentor for me for the rest of my career. I'm <laughs> so touched to be here. So I went to MIT in 1976, and the first thing that uh, happened was um, I hadn't published any of my work as a postdoc, and I discovered that nobody used seconds of UV light as I'd been doing in Bruce Ames' lab. Everybody used a Latarge UV meter, and I didn't know where to get uh, one of those from. So I called Evelyn because uh, they couldn't find them in the catalogs. And she said, Oh, that's because Latarge makes them in his basement in Paris. But I'm going over there soon. I'll tell him you want one. Uh, I'll get it for you. So the next thing that happened to this young uh, professor sitting in his almost empty office in MIT it was Evelyn knocked at my door one day holding a little case with a UV uh, Latarge UV uh, meter. It was one of many things that Evelyn did to sort of give my, uh, encourage me and help me along the way. So my group, as Steve alluded to, was uh, interested in this whole area of SOS responses and mutagenesis. And I had a couple of colleagues uh, who were all younger then, but there's Cynthia Kenyon and Steve Elledge and myself uh, in this picture. And uh, there was, um, Evelyn had uh, published uh, her review at the end of 1976, it was after I got to MIT where she pulled all together, pulled together all these various uh, responses. So most of us sort of had close to memorized this extraordinary feat of uh, synthesis that uh, Evelyn had done at that time. But the idea of genes induced by DNA damage was pretty controversial, especially since uh, work from Jeff Roberts had raised the possibility for a while that Reke was a protease rather than a, something that facilitated an autodigestion of Lexa. And Cynthia Kenyon was a, had the idea of taking the advantage of a new tool devised by uh, uh, Malcolm Cassatabin and Stan Cohen that allowed you to make uh, insertions uh, that cause fusions to a promoterless lack. And so she made a whole lot of insertions and screened for genes that turned on by DNA damage and found genes that we dubbed DIN for damage inducible genes. And these turned out to be a lot of our familiar SOS uh, 
also as friends and their induction depended on Reke and Lexi. Um, meanwhile, um, another thing that Evelyn mentioned to me uh, was there was no PubMed then was that Takisi Kato in Japan had isolated a non-mutable mutant called, U called it UMUC. And it was sort of specifically missing the mutagenesis part of the SOS response. So I thought perhaps what was on my plasmid might be able to, might be a homolog. And we found PKM101 fixed up the, the non-mutability of the UMC mutant. So Steve, uh, who you just heard from, as he said, his thesis project involved the cloning of the chromosomal version of uh, the genes that were on the PKM101 plasmid, and uh, they're very pretty close homologs. And there were two genes we called UMUD and uh, UMUC. Uh, Steve was multi-talented all along the way. I have him at a picture from one of our pizza parties. That was, I think you caught that one, Steve. <laughs> uh, when we sequenced it a couple of years, uh, Later, we were surprised to find that UMUD looked like the back end of Lexa and Lambda repressor. We thought it might have one of the modules that's sort of an auto digestion model, module uh, for that causes the Lexa cleavage. And uh, so, first, we could see how the uh, locus that the UMUC DC locus was regulated by Lexa, and as Lexa got cleaved. Uh, which is a very fast event, uh, then um, that transcribes the UMUC operon. But the cleavage of UMUD is much slower. So it actually seems that the, the intact UMUD works with UMUC as a DNA damage checkpoint, and then very slowly after 30, but 30 minutes, it flips over, and then you get translesion DNA synthesis, which may be a cellular strategy to, uh, to minimize the the, the mutations unless they're really needed after you've tried some accurate ways. UMUC was a bit more frustrating. Uh, we've done all this work hoping to get some clues as to the biochemical function of these. And I remember this conversation I had with uh, Colin Manoil in about 1985. And I said, so frustrating, we just sequenced the E. coli UMUC and PKM1 of U B, and there's nothing like them in the database. And he said, uh, don't be discouraged, you just, sequenced the first members of the next super family and sort of laughed, but over the next, oh, I think 15 years or so, more and more homologs uh, began to appear in the database until finally in one explosive year, it turned out all of the UMUC and all of the homologs were translesion DNA polymerases. UMUC is required for mutagenesis in uh, UMUC and it has to be paired with the cleaved UMUD, so UMUD2 prime UMUC is DNA Paul 5. It turned out that uh, Rev1, which Jeff Lamont, a non-mutable yeast, uh, which you've heard from Steve, is required for mutagenesis. It's a limited tr translation polymerase with a limited ability to add nucleotides, but it has a recruitment domain I'll talk about just briefly later on. And it works together with the other polymerase, Rev3 and Rev7, which is known as Paul Zeta. And you need both of these to do mutagenesis in eukaryotes. The family also included two translesion polymerases that can do accurate bypass of particular lesions. XPV gene product or Paul Eta can copy accurately over cyclobutane dimers, whereas we found that DIN B and its eukaryotic homolog, Paul Kappa, which is DNA Paul 4 and the eukaryotic homolog Paul Kappa can accurately bypass into uh, lonine addicts. So during this whole explosive, as Steve said, it was just the most incredibly exciting time and I can't go through details, but I was, um, there came a landmark in uh, Evelyn's life. I was chairing the Mutagenesis Gordon Conference, co-chairing it with Tom Kunkel there. Evelyn's hiding way up at the back up there. But this, and Evelyn had announced, was the last, uh, her last scientific meeting that she was now going to follow her dream of becoming a Robert Browning scholar. And I was under threat of death, not supposed to do anything to honor uh, this event. But I was housemaster in an MIT 
Owen's dorm at the time with 250 people. And I knew about things like how to talk to kitchens and get sheets cake, a sheet cake made. So I told her we were having a cake and she gave me a look that would kill. And I thought she was going to disown me, but I think she softened when she saw the words uh, SOS and the Ruth Kavanaugh DNA, famous DNA picture and B bar R. And so by the time she got to cut the cake, she was actually even smiling. <laughs> so that was cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that wasn't uh, just because Evelyn went off to be a Browning scholar didn't mean our, our uh, relationship ended and I'll highlight another thing in 2003 that was the 50th anniversary of the DNA uh, structure and there's a special meeting at DN in Cold Spring Harbor that I was asked to talk at and uh, so I was teaching my introductory biology class just before I left and it happened to be on the structure of DNA. So I sh showed the students this iconic picture of Jim pointing at the presenting at the Cold Spring Harbor in 1953. And I said to them, I'm down to the meeting, I'll take some pictures and I'll show you what it's like when I get down there. So I got down there and I took out my key card to check into my room, there was the same picture. And when I got my chance to get up and uh, talk, um, I said to the, the group, I'd like to take a picture so I can show my students. And you'll notice there's Evelyn, there's Miro, Meryl Friedberg. So I have that picture, Evelyn, of you from that special moment. So um, we were, uh, I was lucky to be in a session uh, talking about this aspect of DNA that was chaired by Evelyn and included Miroslav Bradman and myself. And uh, Evelyn, I think uh, the com one of the comments I remember most was Murrow's um, remembrance of what DNA repair was like in 1975, which was the time that I uh, entered the field. He said it was like DNA repair in 1975 was like flossing your teeth. Everybody agreed it, it was important. But do we really need to talk about it right now? And I think you can see the change that's happened now where DNA is just seen as central and fighting off uh, cancer and aging and all manner of things. Another thing that happened that I sat in the front row at that meeting that night and talked to this nice uh, gentleman beside me and I suddenly realized it was McGlynn McCarty of the Avery McLeod McCarty uh, transformation experiment. So on, on a whim, I handed him my uh, notebook and or my uh, program book and he signed it. And I show this to the students telling them I can connect them to that thing through, they, they're connected to that through me. And I gave this thing to other people and as it happened, I didn't script anything, but Jim Watson signed it and Matt Messelson signed it and Wally Gilbert signed it. So when I'm talking about these aspects of uh, DNA to my class, I just move the red arrow around. But what I especially take delight in is Evelyn, your signature was right there and Miro's just below. So every time I show that, I, I get to see your signature. So um, as it turned out, the work you did, I did uh, with uh, early on that was so influenced on you led to some of my other most interesting work. Folk changed the focus to DINB, DNA Paul IV at one point, and in the course of wondering why cells were lethal, why overproduction of DIN-B was lethal, we developed uh, evidence that it was due to react ADOX-ODG getting incorporated into DNA and incomplete base excision repair was causing the death, which I realized was then, we found uh, contributed to uh, antibiotic lethality. We published that in 2012. And those of you who follow such things may know that the idea of ROS and antibiotic lethality became very controversial. And I worked with Jim Collins to try and straighten out that for several years, but I thought there must be some stress that might uh, purely kill by that way. And it turned out to be one of the molly laxy fusions that John Beckwith made years ago. Uh, and it's hundred percent kills by the, a method in which uh, a method where, uh, or by a um, pathway where ADOXOG gets incorporated into DNA. And if you get mute M and mute Y, the two glycosylase is associated with that, skipping the details, you can get double strand breaks and cell death. And there were a variety of genetic tests that supported this, this model. 
that came from the PKM one work. The other one, uh, when 2000, I was named an American Cancer Society professor, I decided I should perhaps do some work on eukaryotic work and started initially in yeast to work on the Rev1 Paul Zeta work that Steve alluded to. Um, but then with Mike Heeman, I was able to um, switch to doing work in mammalian cells. And I'll just highlight one thing. I was wondered if you could improve chemotherapy by blocking mutagenic translation uh, synthesis. And the way we chose to do that was to try and uh, inhibit a recruitment by this is a, c a domain at the C terminus of Rev1, the UMC like polymerase. And here it is recruiting the Rev7 component of the Paul Zeta, Rev3, Rev7. And we found a little drug that amazingly bound in the shallow pocket and caused the two, two Rev1 C termini to dimerize which is remarkable because the molecule is asymmetric, so it has to make different contacts. And it really had a big effect. The cells were killed a lot better by cisplatin uh, and they didn't uh, mutate, which is wonderful. And when we tried it uh, in a xenograph experiment in mouse, mice, it was pretty impressive because it really knocked back. You can sort of get the idea if you put this in the cisplatin. Uh, it, it looks, and we're trying to follow up on that. So I just close by a few other things uh, that Evelyn did for me. As a young professor, there were no poster sessions, and you had to be bold enough to get asked to get it, uh, added to some session. And the 1978 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, um, I was too shy to do that, but Evelyn was doing the last session in the meeting on the common and functions and repair and asked me if I'd like to give a short talk. And I said, yes. And so I was the last speaker at the end of this extremely long and exhausting uh, um, meeting. And the, the attendance was a little spotty. It was after the banquet and Friday morning was a little thin. And I thought, oh boy, there's gonna be nobody here by the time I talked. But as it turned out, uh, Frank Stahl was the um, summary speaker where he made this famous uh, comment about uh, he thought he could hear the biochemists circling in the night around the homologous recombination problem. So as it got closer and closer to my talk, the room got fuller and fuller and fuller. And Evelyn, the most uh, crowded room I've ever spoken to <laughs> was that talk. So thank you. Evelyn was there when I was uh, inducted into the uh, National Academy of Sciences. I came down from the stage of the ceremony. I could hear her yelling uh, and cheering for me. And uh, this was uh, a dinner that we all had together. Steve, I think this might have been where your picture was from, but you'll notice uh, Steve and his wife, Nipsey Carota, and uh, Cynthia Kenyon, and Jasper Ryan, and Phil Hanwald, and Barbara Meyer in there, and as well as my wife, Jan. But Evelyn, there you are at the center, as you've been with so much of my life. You also, uh, I was so inspired by your uh, review that in 1984, I tried to go in your footsteps and I talked to you about this. And I just learned so much about your way of synthesis and your boldness in writing. And that ended up, uh, Errol Friedberg asked me to fight co-author a textbook with them. And that led to two versions of this, each of which ate about <laughs> my years of my life. And one other thing uh, I'll just say, uh, Nelson Leonard, who I worked with, was a good enough, uh, such a great scientist, but he also was good enough to sing solo of Chicago Symphony. And Evelyn was not only a great scientist, but a Robert Browning scholar. And this sort of inspired me to try and follow my passions too. And I tried to integrate music occasionally into my uh, life. One of the most fun times I ever had in science was when I uh, organized a 600 person DNA repair meeting in 2004. And we wrote a song called the DNA Repair Blues, which I performed with uh, Rick Wood on bass, who's an amazing bass player, Errol Freeberg, and then my co-organizers, uh, Susan Wallace and Cynthia Kenyon and our um, or a keynote speaker, Phil, um, that. So the one thing uh, in your career, I often tell the young students who ask me for letters, you, you don't, you pay forward. Don't worry about asking me, I'll write more letters than you want. You don't ever seldom get to write letters for people who uh, helped you. 
but it was great moments in my life when I was invited to write a letter to uh, nominate Evelyn for the Lasker. I understood it might be merged with one for Steve Elledge and what a thrill, as you've heard, they got that. And thanks to them, I was able to be there, be part of that, Evelyn uh, and Steve. And Evelyn, uh, I don't know what to say. You're not only the most wonderful scientific colleague, a dear friend, a mentor, but I think you're my guardian angel. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Thank you for that great talk and a lot of historical moments there. <laughs>